Can move the chair. Can we can move the table? Just, no, just sit down. Please. Welcome, welcome to the Berkeley East Bay Great Panthers. Hello. 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 proud and ple pleased to have three mayors here so far. We hope that the other three will arrive shortly. Uh, we have our current mayor, Tom Bates, uh, and two runners-up, Chris Worthington and Jacqueline McCormick. And we have a series of questions that we would like to ask them. And if you have questions for them after they're through with their opening statement, and then we have four questions we would like to ask, and when you, then it's your opportunity to ask questions. Each of you should have received a card and a pencil. And if you have a question, please raise your hand and we will be glad to pick it up, pick up your card. So at this point, I would like to turn the meeting over to our facilitator, George Lipman, who is chair of the Peace and Justice Commission for the city of Berkeley. Thank you very much for coming today. Uh, the addition of Zachary Running Wolf, who is also running for mayor. Bravo! There's a possibility we'll have two more candidates appear later, and that would be uh, Khalil Jacobs Fantuzzi and uh, Bert Wall. However, they're not here yet. Thank you for your attention. Let's hand it over to uh, George Newman. Thank you, Margo. There's a question about the sound. How's the sound coming across? Perfect. No distortion? Okay, thank you. Well, it's really an honor to be here today, uh, this beautiful afternoon, on behalf of the Great Panthers of East Bay in Berkeley. Is it good? Okay, perfect. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to explain the format for today's uh, forum. First of all, We'll give three minutes for each candidate for mayor for their opening statement. Then we'll present a series of questions, of four questions to each candidate. Okay. And for each individual, they'll have two minutes to answer each question. Uh, then we will have uh, questions from the audience. The format, as Margot mentioned, we will not have um, questions stated verbally by members of the audience. They'll, we're asking for them to be written down. We'll consolidate them so that we can get through as much content as possible by the end of the, of the hour and a half to two hours. So please make sure that you put your questions on the cards that are provided. If you don't have a card, uh, ask and one will be given to you. And finally, uh, this is not an endorsement form, in my understanding. Uh, the Great Panthers do not make endorsements. Um, the organization is asking that people uh, behave respectfully. I'm sure everyone will. Um, and uh, show respect for all the candidates. Um, and uh, you can, I, I don't know about curbing your enthusiasm. Enthusiasm is a good thing. But um, we're going to respect um, all points of view in this discussion. Now, the way that the um, order is going to proceed, the candidates have not been briefed on this, but we're going to give the three minutes in order of um, where people are seated. <laughs> so that makes it random. So, but, and then in the first question that comes up, uh, the next person will have the opportunity to go first. And finally, when we give the closing statements, we'll reverse the order. Hope that's fair. Um, we're going to start then on my far right. Yes, we'll start on my far right with Jacqueline McCormick, and then after each, if that's okay, and then um, and then after three minutes, we have a timekeeper who is here. Right here. And let's do a demonstration. Stop time up. That's not the first one. That's the last one. We've got one minute, one minute thirty seconds, and stop times up. And we're going to be pretty firm so that we have the appearance and reality of fairness to everyone. Thank you. 
grab the microphone for him. Hello everyone, thank you so much for having us. I'm Jacqueline McCormick, as I was introduced, and I must say that I'm very pleased that Zachary came because I was very upset when I looked on the stage and found that I wore the wrong color of shirt. Everybody else seemed to have a blue shirt, and I didn't get the memo. Um, but let's get on to something a little bit more serious, and that's this mayoral candidacy and this election. We have the opportunity um, this year to make a true dynamic change in the makeup of our city council. Um, and I really want to be part of, of seeing that that gets done. One of the biggest issues facing our community, whether we like it or not, has to do with our budget and the fact that we have ever shrinking, <coughs> continuing needs, basically needs that are staying the same or growing, and revenues that are essentially flat. And as a result of that, We've had significant cuts to our city social services. Seniors, in particular, have been cut. Senior, pro senior programs have been cut about 57%. And there's only two, less than 2% of our budget that's allocated to our social service program. I am very, very concerned about the direction that this is taking and what this means for us as a community and not being able to, stay, to serve those members of our community who are most vulnerable. And development of one bedroom and studio apartments in downtown Berkeley to service um, young people and students are not going to save us. We need to provide housing for middle income families. That's what built Berkeley in the first place. That's what makes us the thriving, wonderful place that we are. And that is not being addressed. We need to have open communication with our community so we're assured that what, is, what the decisions that are being made by city council are those that reflect the needs and the wants and the desires of our community itself. I am committed to have monthly town forums all throughout the city in areas where people can actually get there and we can have good dialogue about specific issues and anything else that is bothering you in your communities. And it will be a great opportunity for members of our community to come together and, and as a community face the challenges that are coming upon us. There really is no other community that I know of that has the richness of intellectual wealth that we do here in Berkeley. And it's not being utilized right now. We, I know we can solve these issues that are in front of us, but it's a matter of engaging the community and being having the community be part of it. And I want to lead that effort, and I really want you to consider me as your candidate for mayor. Thanks. My name is Chris Worthington, and I'm here to say it's time. It's time for a mayor who will stop the absurdity of city council meetings where you have to come and sit there for hours and hours and hours before you get a chance to talk on a hot topic. <laughs> it's time for a mayor who will say, trickle-down development doesn't work. We need community-based development, economic development, and building that has community benefits such as affordable housing, open space, addresses transit, traffic, parking. Um, if the developers are going to get what they want, the public deserves to know that they're going to get what they need. We, we need a mayor who will give every ethnic group and every age in our city a fair chance. Every year the students at Cal do a study, and every year we come up with, you know, certain politicians appoint a wide range of people and certain politicians don't. And almost every year, the incumbent has one African American and one Latino out of 33 commissioners. It's time for a mayor who gives Asians, Latinos, and African Americans a fair share to serve in these important commission positions. It's time for a mayor who thinks that senior citizens should be allowed to come to city council meetings, 
and not be treated with disrespect. In fact, no matter what age you are, you shouldn't be treated with disrespect. How many senior citizens can come to a city council meeting and wait until 11 or 12 o'clock at night in order to have their one or two minute public comment? How many disabled people can come and stay four, five, six hours waiting for their precious one minute to say what they believe? Yeah. It's time for us to reform the Permit Service Center. Our permit service center, whether you're a contractor trying to build a project, or whether you're a neighborhood group trying to oppose a project, it drives everybody crazy. And if you're a homeowner just trying to do some little thing, like this woman was trying to get a hot tub for her husband who was sick, she had to go four different times in order to find out what they wanted her to do. It's time to reform the parking citation and administration, and yeah. administrative yes. citation process. Okay. Why should you have to drive to City Hall and to get an administrative citation and take up prime downtown parking spaces? Um, <clears throat> it's time for a new mayor. It's time for a mayor who, respect, who reflects the progressive values and stops the delay and defeat of important public policies such as affordable housing, campaign finance reform. Most people do not understand how many progressive policies have been delayed and defeated. It's time for a new mayor. Thank you. Well, I don't think it's quite that time yet. <laughs> Thank you. So I'm Tom Bates, and I've had the pleasure of being your mayor for 10 years. And of course, I've had a lifetime of, of public service to this community. I was their city. Excuse me, I was a county supervisor for four years where we started the Asian Health Clinic, the Asian Mental Health Clinic, Filipinos for Affirmative Action, the Free Clinic, the Clinica de la Raza, you name it, we were involved with, with the beginning of that. I served in the legislature for 20 years and I was a progressive there and I'm progressive now. Uh, I passed 220 laws, a lot of them are going to affect you know, seniors, a lot of them affect transportation, housing, a variety of issues. So I have been on the cutting edge of, of, of change, and I'm, as a progressive leader, I've been in charge of pushing the envelope as far as possible. Being the mayor of Berkeley has not been easy these 10 years. I mean, I, when I came in, you know, the economy went into the tank, and we have had to, to scramble to keep it going. But I think anybody who looks at it fairly and objectively has to come to the conclusion that Berkeley's done a lot better than the rest of the cities around us. We balanced our budgets. We have a triple, a, excuse me, a double A plus bond rating, which is the highest of a city our size. We continue with services. We continue to provide things for people who need them. We've expanded some homeless services and children's and youth services. So it hasn't been all downhill, but still, it's not been a great place to be. I want to tell you that during this time as mayor, we've taken on the major issues of the day. We've taken on the issues of trying to deal with the achievement gap on our schools, and I'll have a chance to hopefully talk about that more. Working with, this, with the school district, we've seen great success. We're making progress. That's one of the main issues. The other thing is climate change, global warming. Berkeley is at the forefront of global warming and climate change. We've done more than most any city. Our plan is considered by the UN to be the best in North America. We've seen electricity use in, in people's residence go down by 10%. Well, we have grown, the city has grown during the last 10 years by almost 10%. So we're making progress. We're also now trying to figure out how we can get more jobs for young people, how we can start businesses and we can have them expand in business Berkeley, not just start here and then go to Silicon Valley or San Francisco. So I've been on the forefront of trying to make that happen. And I've been endorsed by Congresswoman Barbara Lee, Senator State Senator Lonnie Hancock, Nancy Skinner, the, the Sierra Club, the Building Trades of Alameda County, the Alameda County Lawyers, and I would appreciate your support this November. Thank you. Hello, um, I'd like to introduce myself. This is very poignant that we're uh, kicking this off with our seniors. I'm a Native American elder. And in the Native community, our elders are our most valued asset. So I'd like to start off with that. And I appreciate this, this moment to address our elders. We don't disrespect our elders in the Native community. 
Here, Mayor Bates touched on one something that I'm very concerned in is global climate change. And we need to broaden this thing other than rearranging the debt chairs on the Titanic. Because, yes, this, we have an international responsibility as the city of Berkeley to respond that way. And we both also need to help the small business. I have a two-part plan. It is One is closing down Telegraph, which is getting support to pedestrian only, putting the businesses out into the street. This is will create jobs. It's already proven as an economic benefit with the craft fair, the winter craft fair. Bicycle living libraries at every BART station. So we're addressing global climate change by introducing pedestrians from the BART stations as they enter this city. Also, in Emeryville Roundabout for our disabled and elderly people. When I talk about stop driving, I'm not talking about our elders or our people in the hills getting out of their cars. I'm targeting our young people who are going to inherit this world. And this is focused on the University of California at Berkeley students. So when, when people spread rumors about my campaign, it's targeted at our youth, not at our disabled, not at our people. Uh, we're going to speak about housing project coming up. None of these candidates can say that affordable housing hasn't gone slipped through their fingers in the responsibility. These developers have always said 10% of low income housing. This is Mayor Bates, Worthington, have never been able to basically get our developers to allocate these, these um, you know, low income housing. So they have failed on this level. I am a strong leader, not a career politician. People may say I've run three times, three times. But if you look at my campaign, not one item has changed. I don't flip fly. I am an elder. I do not sell my mother out. I will stand for the residents of Berkeley. Chris Worthington brought up that we need a, a representative for the student. We need a representative for the resident. And I am your candidate. Aho. Uh -huh. housing, the issue of housing. The question is, what can you and the city do with respect to housing to better serve low-income people and seniors? City policies include rent control, so-called affordable housing construction, vacancy fees for landlords, and possibly eminent domain of empty properties, and fighting against foreclosure. What sets you apart from other candidates on this subject? And there'll be two minutes for each answer. Well, I think part of the answer should be what you've already done and part what you're going to do. What I've already done is I've led the charge at the city council to uh, put money into the housing trust fund. I've identified a general fund that can go there. I've, I've identified the sale of, of property and designated the funding. When we had two controversial issues fighting with each other, which housing project's going to get built, and some people were choosing one and some the other, I said, Let's commit ourselves to make both of these major projects happen, and they both got approved by the city council against great odds. In terms of foreclosure, I believe every major policy on foreclosure that the city has discussed in the last 10 years was written by my city council office, uh, including the most recent one. Um, in terms of upcoming things, um, I have been trying to get the city to commit to a $28,000 per unit fee as recommended by the Rent Board and the Housing Advisory Commission. New developers that are building things should pay for the uh, impact of, of the need for affordable housing. $28,000 doesn't even give us, per unit, doesn't even give us the amount of, money, of units that we got under the previous 
inclusionary housing ordinance. We also need to address the so-called affordability because we need housing for people at 20%, 30%, and 50% of area median income. I don't earn enough money as a city council member. I can't even apply to be in affordable housing because I don't have enough money to qualify. We need housing for people who are homeless to transition into uh, uh, housing and for people that literally uh, half or less, 30%, 20%. I have passionate, um, thank you. <laughs> so we have to look at what we've done. In 10 years since I've been the mayor, we have constructed in Berkeley 3,000 new units, 3,000 new units of which 700 of those are what we call workforce. Those are people who make less, you know, more than 50% medium income. We have built 300 low-income, very low-income, and they're all senior housing, almost all of them are senior housing. And we're going to continue to do that. If we have some opportunities. We have an opportunity on Adeline, where the property's been vacant for a number of years. We have a chance to put another opportunity for senior housing to go right there. So we haven't, I haven't just talked about it. We've actually done it, and we're going to continue to do it. Now let me just tell you, what was happened is there's a decision, a court decision that came down that said we cannot no longer require people to set aside a certain percentage of, of rental units for low and moderate income people. Um, and so we're now talking about establishing a fee. Mr. Worthington would like to have a fee of $28,000 per unit for new units that are built. That sounds great. That really sounds wonderful. But you know what? Nobody will do it. What they'll do is they'll take the state density bonus, which means a 10% will be low income, not, the, not a larger percentage, it'll only be 10%. So we're going to have to be really creative. We've got an opportunity lot right up here on, on, excuse me, on Berkeley Way that could be easily be another place for senior housing. There's other parts of town that we know that we need to look to see what we can do to provide affordable housing for people. It's the biggest problem. I mean, as people cannot afford to live here, and that's, that's a shame because we're losing our our whole community is being is moved out, being gentrified out of Berkeley. So I'm going to fight. I've been a long time supporter of rent control. I believe that that's the way to go. I'm also trying to think about some new innovative ways to get money into our housing trust fund. We have had a provision that people could switch from, from ticks, which is a form of ownership, to condos. And we were going to get all this money, but we've gotten zero. So we need to revisit that, try to figure out how to make that really work. We also need to figure out how we can get people who come into our community really build this housing and build it for affordable people. So I'm going to continue on the case. Right. Thank you. Right. Well, um, affordable housing contracts were, were always put out 10% for affordable housing. This has been overlooked by our city council and by our mayor for literally decades. So all you have to do is go back to these contracts and live up to them. And basically, Ali Kashani, Patrick Kennedy, these developers who were given basically free passes, subsidized, can be held accountable and bring that 10% back. I will do that. As far as um, foreclosures, I'm with the Oakland Occupation. I'm with the tree sitters who were up in the um, up in the trees for 648 days. You need us to come down, the mayor which no career politician seems to show up on any scene now, I will come and sit in your foreclosed house because these banks are so arrogant that they think that they can get a bailout and then come and steal your property. Are you kidding me? I, as mayor, am a strong mayor. I'm not, I'm going to participate. I will be there in your house or maybe in your tree. <laughs> <laughs> So, you know, this is something that I call on these career politicians to come back out. Chris Rivington used to come on scene, but where has he been? Now. But you need, need somebody to stand strong with you. And that's what I will do. Oh, I still have 30 seconds. So, um, anyway, you just tighten these, these um, already promises and you go back and you penalize developers like Ali Kashani who is still here. Patrick Kennedy had to flee to San Francisco now to make his little rat trap um, places out in the city. So I will hold those developers accountable. Ho. Oh.
that was made federally was to ensure that we provide affordable housing, that every urban environment provide affordable housing. And it's a shame that that law was overturned, essentially by the development community. Housing is our biggest need in this community, and it's not getting addressed. The units that have been purported to have been built were approved many, many years ago. There's really nothing new that's been on the table and put on the table in the last 10 years. The only thing that's been put on the table is for new development of high-rise residential buildings in downtown Berkeley and potentially residential development big projects in West Berkeley. In both of these cases, in particularly in downtown, two years ago Measure R was passed. It has been two years and council has not yet set an affordable housing fee. Two years. In the West Berkeley project, there has been absolutely no promise of providing affordable housing out there. I believe that not only should new development pay to the Affordable Housing Trust Fund, they must provide inclusionary housing in every project that gets built. Two, twofold, not one or the other, not a fee in lieu. It has to be provided in every new development that gets built. And what is more troubling to me is in all this new development, I've said it and I will continue to push this forward, there is no proposal for any development in this community to provide residences for middle income families. There is nothing on the table to provide that. It's all one bedroom and studio apartments. We are not addressing the needs that made this community what it is today. And I want to make that change. Oh, bravo. <clears throat> Thank you. Our second question regards transportation. Transportation around the Bay Area can be difficult for seniors. We have AC Transit and Paratransit serving those who do not drive, and they have limitations. Moreover, there are parking issues for those who do drive. What can you and the City of Berkeley do to improve transportation for seniors and disabled people? Well, as it turns out, I'm on the Metropolitan Transportation Commission. This is the commission that the Alameda County mayors appoint as their representative to represent Alameda County. And I've been there for almost five years. And I have been pushing for, for things like getting more paratransit, like getting opening up more opportunities for public transportation, and more opportunities for car share, more opportunities for people to, to use the bus. If you look at it, people who go there, the, one of the reasons why if you believe in transportation is an issue, you should be supporting me because I'm, if I am somehow or other defeated in this election, nobody from Berkeley is going to be on that commission. It's going to be somebody else from Pleasanton or some other mayor from another city. And I'm right there at the hot seat, and I'm pushing every day. You can just talk to people about <coughs> pedestrian working, people working. I had a meeting today, this very day, and I was also pushing to make sure that we have bus service, better bus service. BRT? And the issue is, it's not enough BRT? to talk about it. You have to have money. And the money goes through the Metropolitan Transportation Commission, where I sit right there, one of 19 people. And I push every day, as I say, as your representative, your advocate, because there aren't many people who are there, who are from the progressive community, who are sitting right at the table. And if I am, you know, unfortunately, if you think I'm not doing so hot elsewhere, if you like the fact that I'm pushing for this, these kinds of things, I need your support. Because I can tell you, none of these people, as good as they may be, will ever be appointed to that commission because the Alameda County Mayor is his most coveted position of mayors. And I'm there because they trusted me. They knew my experience in the state legislature. They knew I was married to an assemblywoman that became a senator. They knew I had the contacts, and I've been using those contacts. We have three million dollars that just got approved in the Elmwood to get more city car shares, to get more opportunities for people to ride home. And I see I have 30 seconds. Ride home, that they guaranteed ride home. Nobody else could do that. In fact, we figured out while I've been the mayor, while I've been the mayor, my contacts. And working with the other representatives, like Congresswoman Lee, my wife, Nancy Skinner, that I have been able to bring in over a hundred million dollars into the city through the contact. So I think that I've done a good job and I think I'm going to continue to be able to do those things in the future. Okay. To the time period, don't worry, I know the candidates are, are watching 
and, and they, they've got their eyes on the signs, so don't, don't worry, you don't have to call special attention to it. Okay. All right, um, he, he spoke about being on the trans, trans, uh, transit council. He's done a terrible job. He basically has broken apart. Anybody been on AC Transit? The 51 stops at the Rodbridge Bar Station. Totally, totally, you gotta, if you're not aware, you gotta pay another fare. Yeah. He's done a terrible job. I've actually worked with AC Transit from the outside and I've done a better job. I got 38 buses with the help of Rebecca Kaplan on biodiesel to fight climate change. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. This, he helped defeat Mayor Bates' ill-conceived BRT, which was a HUD housing scam all the way down town. But it was assault on the vendors that I'm trying to help by closing down Telegraph. So we need a break from this nonsense that we call the BRT Express. And watch out, it's probably going to go to another, another line, according to inside rumors, a transit village coupled with um, um, eminent domain. So this is an assault on your communities. <clears throat> Okay, thank you. Um, so basically through um, helping our elders, which we don't disrespect in the Native community, and our disabled, we will be, like I said before, asking the young people to get out of their cars. So we don't have to stop. When, when I have a stop driving campaign, if you go to stopdriving.org, we did an international campaign addressing global climate change with the help of the Zapatistas the Mohawk Warrior Society, and we're shutting it down. But it's not attacking our older people, and it's not asking our disabled people to stop driving. And please understand that about my plan. The, our plan is to help, to help, not to make a profit. Oh. Whoa. 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 I want to introduce our fifth uh, candidate for mayor, Khalil Jacobs Fatauzi, and he has come a little late, but only because he's working with our young people. He's a middle school teacher. I'm going to allow him now to give us a three-minute opening. So, either way, it's up to you. We can get Hello, how are you doing? My name is Khalil Jacobs Fanta Uzi. It's an honor to be here. I am a middle school teacher, so it's hard for me to escape in the middle of the day. But um, I know that I have a different perspective. I think that it's a beautiful thing that this year you'll be able to choose more than one. I think that the vision for our city has to include all aspects and communities. And I think that historically that has not happened. There's been communities that have not been a part of the discussion. Those communities include people from South Berkeley, people from West Berkeley. Those communities include young people, those in communities include the elderly, those communities include women who have not had positions of power in our city. And I hope that this process brings democracy to our city in a new way. Unfortunately, in the past, we have had people that have taken positions of power and have not been willing to allow for a new generation, for a new vision, for a new face, for new ideas. And one of the first things that I would institute is term limits. Why, why do we not have something that says, hey, you know, you don't have to be mayor for 15 years, or you were mayor and your wife was mayor, and there's, there's, it seems like we don't have the capacity to grow. So it's kind of gotten caught up in people that have taken positions of power and are not really ready to allow other people to be a part of that conversation. And when we talk about diversity, and we talk about the beauty of our city, we know that we are one of the most amazing cities in the world because of that beauty. And a lot of the times we have lived off of the legacy of activism that happened in the 60s and 70s that probably the majority of people in this room were a part of. And it's time for our city to reflect a more progressive, a more radical politic in terms of being able to listen to the citizens of this community, in terms of being able to reflect ideas that benefit everyone and not just certain um, interest groups. 
And so the reason why I'm running for mayor is because I feel that we need to have a new vision. We need to have an opportunity for different segments of our community to come together in a new way. And as I've started to run for mayor, I've started something called the listening campaign, where I've also been listening to our constituents because I don't think not one of us up here have all the answers. And we have to be able to listen to come up with a vision that includes everybody's idea. And so it's an honor to be here. I look forward to participating in this debate. And unfortunately, there has not been a lot of debate. So I really do commend the Great Panthers for putting this together because because even at the university that there was a debate that was scheduled, all of a sudden they said that they didn't want to have a debate. And unfortunately, Tom Bates and, and all of us have not had the opportunity to really debate issues that you need to hear. So it's an honor to be here and I'm excited to participate. Thank you very much for understanding. I'm sorry for my tardiness. left off on the question of transportation. Yes, we are part of a regional framework of transportation needs. And Mayor Bates has participated in making those decisions. But we cannot solely rely on those, those methods of transportation to, uh, to adequately address our needs here in Berkeley. I believe we need to be able to stand on our own. We need to be able to provide transportation for people who are not capable of driving themselves and are, do not live on major transportation thoroughfares. We need to find a way to be able to provide an on-call, on-demand shuttle service to our commercial areas and our neighborhoods. We need to make our downtown, first of all, we need to revitalize our downtown so there's really a there there that gives us a reason to come downtown. So maybe there's some great shops and great events that we can participate in. But in doing so, we need to make it easy for people to come down that don't have modes of public transportation at their beck and call. That is a real challenge for us, especially across town. Going north south, there are opportunities. We don't have that much opportunity across town. And we need to provide ways for people to be able to drive downtown, to be able to park, to run quick errands, and not, you know, get a parking ticket or be charged three dollars for twenty, you know, twenty minutes. We need to look at making ourselves a friendly environment for our community. That's how community gets built. We need to put Berkeley first and Berkeley Berkeleyans first, and our community needs to be the forefront of every decision that's made. Thanks. Well, any good answer to this question has to start with Measure B-1. In November, we get to vote for a massive increase in funding for public transit, including for paratransit. Um, and that's called Measure B-1. And it's true that the mayors voted for our current mayor to be on one committee, but those same mayors and the Board of Supervisors also voted for, to make me the vice chair of the entire $8 billion expenditure plan for all of Alameda County. So Berkeley has more than one person who actually can get out there and fight for money for the city and for public transit. <laughs> the incumbent was very upset that I did not vote for his budget and one, in several years. One of the main reasons is I believe you need to chomp at the top and affect how much the people making a couple hundred thousand dollars and not chop at the lower middle class and the poor. That budget that I voted against took away the precious little script that our senior citizens used to get and now you have to be older and you have to be really poorer in order to get it. People who are only poor cannot get it anymore. And if you're only lower middle class, forget it. And if you're only a little bit old, I mean, you qualify as a senior citizen, but you're not old enough to get the, the script for transit. That was an abysmal, immoral vote for the city council to do that, and I fought it, but we lost. Uh, the, the buses. 
you know, we, we got uh, buses that I'm not a senior citizen, although I'm getting close and I've gotten a lot of gray hair since I got elected. <laughs> but <clears throat> I get on the buses and I can hardly walk to a seat because the buses that were purchased are so treacherous as they're, they're just, they're not going all that fast, but it's dangerous to walk to your seat. Um, we need to address those kinds of issues. We need to strongly support funding for public transit in every way. I pushed very hard to uh, move a billion dollars within the countywide transportation plan, and now we have Measure B1, which is gonna give us more than a doubling of public transit funds. Thank you. Thank you. I think Chris has um, done a wonderful job of articulating ways that we can improve transportation in our city. Metro B1 is one of those ways. Um, and I know, because I also ride the bus often on Sacramento and Derby, and what also I've seen happen is that there are bus drivers that are completely impatient. I've seen them be impatient with mothers and their kids. I've seen them be impatient with people that are in wheelchairs. I've seen them be impatient and sometimes actually just drive by instead of stopping. And I think that that has to do with the training of the drivers. And I think that we need to have sensitivity and cultural training and awareness that these drivers are public servants and they need to make sure that they are doing a good job to everyone and not just helping out certain segments of our society. I think that we also have to come up with plans that, um, that include opportunities for both the elderly and young people to be able to access the buses. I think that what's happened in San Francisco with the initiative to have free muni for young people is amazing and it's something that we need to see here in Berkeley. There's no reason why a kid should not be able to go to community college. There's no reason why somebody should not be able to go to do community service or to get out of their neighborhood so that they could expand and learn about other neighborhoods. These are things that our city needs and as we've seen, the budgets and the way that the city runs is to, is to appease a certain population. And so we need to really reflect on our city to make sure that people are respected, especially citizens that have special needs. And I think that I can provide that vision. Thank you very much. So we're going to move on to the next question, but first I want to show, if anyone can see my table, we've gotten something like 35 questions from the audience. There is no way that we're going to get through all the questions from the audience today. I'm going to encourage people on questions such as the next one to keep your answers as brief as possible while getting out the point that you need to make. The next question is, and I'll begin with... Is it? Yeah, that's Do you want to respond to that question? Sure. Question. I think this is on the transportation. Yeah, we already did it. So we're done. Yeah, we're done. Okay. Brevity is what I'm looking for. Uh, brevity and depth at the same time. The question is, how would you approve city council meetings so that those who wish to comment on issues can do so in a timely and effective fashion? Comment yes. time is often late at night and sometimes can be too short. Yes. Um, I was one of the first ones to point out that basically the lottery pick in the beginning of the meeting is is a violation of the Brown Act. So, in the city of Oakland, you show up, no matter how many people show up, they get to speak. As a mayor, I'm a strong leader, and it's an honor to lead you people. So it's an honor that I would take that. So I would sit there and listen, and I don't even agree with the two minutes. But you do need to speed things up. But everybody would get two minutes on any subject. And important subjects move to the front of the council. If 25 or 20 or more people show up, I would move it to the first item and not make people sit there and wait like Mayor Bates has done so many times. So I would honor and respect. It would be an automatic rule. If 20 or more people showed up, first. And then you get to go home because you people are tired. Some people are holding down two jobs in this rotten economy. So you honor your people. You listen. It's an honor to be out there and to be out in front, just like I am in the Native community. 
It's an honor. How many times has we been, we built the American Indian Public Charter School, and these Native women who were mothers, single mothers, would come to board meetings after holding down two jobs, and we would work it through. I come from a community that has been under attack, and that's what makes us a community. That's what makes us a community, and I would like to build one here. Move. How many people have been to a city council meeting? How many people have felt like they've given, they've had enough time to articulate what they were there for? No one. Very few. One person. Maybe you've been to eight meetings. The reality is that what has happened is, you know, as we saw with what happened with the sit lie law, in terms of that even being on the ballot, what we've seen even in terms of Iceland, all these community issues that are so critical for our city to survive and be beneficial have been taken away from even having an opinion heard. Not only, yeah, you can clap for that, that's true. We have not even heard what our citizens want. So how do we have a mayor who thinks he's reflecting the needs of the city and you don't even get an opportunity to hear from the people that live in that city? What type of democracy is that? What, what type of civil, uh, civic participation is that? It's not, it's not there. So we have to come up with ways that empower people to speak. First of all, we want more people at city council. We want people to be there. We want people to be able to express their ideas because as leaders, that's what we will learn from. That's how we can come up with an opinion that is based on other people's needs, not just individuals' needs. So if we had a city council that was and that the hours were earlier, that more people were able to speak, that people were not forced to speak for one minute or two minutes, when people could actually articulate their ideas, I think that it would not only make me a good leader, but it would make this city a wonderful city. Thank you very much. Over the past two years, I've been to every council meeting. I started a website two years ago called Berkeley Council Watch, and I did it because there is no easy way for someone within the community to go online and figure out what's going on in council meetings, to look at the underlying documents, to find out what happened. You have to click through a million different things, and the purpose of that website was to provide a way for people to easily figure out what's coming in council, what we're going to address, what, you, what happened, and if you wanted to comment on anything, to be able to do that because I was delivering and would deliver those comments to the city clerk so they could be included in the supplemental communication package. There is no reason why our city can't do that for our citizens today. It is, people should be able to come out to council meetings. They should, when there are big item, big ticket items on the agenda, those should come first. We have our biggest crowds. They should not be pushed to the end as they're done time and time and time again. Additionally, People should be regarded with courtesy. People should not be laughing and talking while they're speaking. They shouldn't be laughed at. They shouldn't have songs sung to them. And I have personally experienced that sitting in the audience watching that kind of behavior come from the dais. That is inappropriate. It is disrespectful for the people who come to these meetings, take their personal time to come and voice their concern. It's absolutely inappropriate. We need to have a system for the people who work, who work in three or four jobs, who do not have the capacity, are not well enough to come to city council meetings, to be able to provide your opinion <clears throat> online and to have it be considered. I will put that in place as mayor. I have attended every regular city council meeting for 16 years. <laughs> and the tragedy about this question is the solutions are so simple and so easy to fix. Number one, and, the, and this is the only subject in which the mayor really has the power to, to fix things. The mayor is a ceremonial figurehead most of the time, legally. But this is something the mayor actually controls, is setting the order of the agenda and, and, and how we run our meetings. And I, I think uh, Running Wolf is sort of starting to run in the right direction on this, but he's going too conservatively. 
instead of moving things up to the beginning of a long night, if we know there's going to be 50 or 100 people there, it should be on a separate night all by itself. And if we know there's going to be hundreds of people coming, like we knew with Pacific Steel Casting, there were 400 people there, we move to a bigger room so that people can actually sit in the room. It costs a little tiny bit of money to videotape it in a different room, and everyone can participate equally coming in and sitting down and getting their chance to listen as well as have their say. But more than that, the disrespect that the public experiences, watch a city council meeting shared by the mayor and watch a city council meeting shared by the vice mayor. Compare those two meetings. Pick any meeting when the vice chair chairs the meeting compared to a meeting where the, where the mayor chairs the meeting. The public is treated with dignity and respect by the vice mayor. That's not the case at regular council meetings. But it's not just the public. It's council members. When Laurie Capitelli attacks Max Anderson repeatedly, the chair should be a parliamentarian and say, excuse me, this is not the place for that. One council member should not be verbally assaulting another one just because Max Anderson is an eloquent orator and a progressive voice and, and he gets standing ovations from the, city, from the people in the audience and somebody attacks him because he's being rhetorical. It's beautiful, profound, powerful rhetoric that is leading us to take a progressive stance. We need a new mayor. Thank yeah. you. Thank you very much. Well, I, you know, I've really heard you about the, the meetings and things. And, you know, I, first of all, the first, we have a responsibility to make decisions. And we shouldn't make the decisions way later time. I think we'll all agree on that. We get cranky, we get, you know, stubborn. So we need to figure out how we can do things differently. Mm -hmm. When I came in, what happened was I, we put in a rule that said you can only speak for one minute with four people, three people could yield, so one person could have four minutes. And that's worked pretty, pretty successfully. It's not been great. And I think the biggest problem is the forum itself. Mm -hmm. If I'm reelected, which I hope I will be, I'm going to try to restructure some other ways of doing some decisions. Because what happens is people just get up and talk for two or three minutes or four minutes or whatever, and there's no real discussion or dialogue because the forum does not allow that. So what I'm going to try to do in the, in the future is actually sit together and put together what I was successful when I was in the legislature, a round table of people, and we'll put together various people. This will not be an official meeting of the city council. We'll put together a series of round tables. We'll hear from all different points of view. And we'll try to discuss and debate the issues so we can have a forum where we can actually bring, to, uh, bring out the issues and then when we get to the city council, since we're restricted in the kind of forum we have, uh, we'll be able to at least have had that dialogue. So that's something that I promise you that if I'm re-elected, I will put that in play. The other thing I want you to know is that I, I really, I don't like to, I don't think I'm disrespectful to people. And I, and I think it's really, it really can sort of says that, but I don't think that's true. I try to be respectful of all points of view. And I try to be run the meeting as fairly as I can. And um, if I'm re-elected, I will do the best I can to be the best kind of mayor that you, you want. One that will listen, one that will act, and one that will try to be more inclusive. So thank you. We're next going to turn to the issue of the SIT ordinance, Measure S. And Measure T. I think I want to focus right now on Measure S because I've gotten seven or eight cards on the subject. So okay. the question from the Great Panthers is, is simply, please briefly, briefly tell us your position on Measure S, the sit and lie law proposed for the November ballot comment. Many children in juvenile hall started down the wrong path by being charged with major infractions. Mr. Mayor and candidates, how would Measure S, this is directed to, to Mayor Bates, how would Measure S, if if it passes, help or alleviate this problem? Uh, would you be willing to let Provo Park, Willard, and Ohlone Parks have tents so that the homeless don't have to sleep on concrete sidewalks? Um, and the last question, how was it that the City Council approved the Homeless People's Bill of Rights and the Civil Sidewalk Ballot Initiative, the sit and lie, on the same, on the same night, I believe, which are oppositional to each other? And that is directed to Mayor Bates and Chris Livington. 
for anyone to speak to any of this. This is, this is a wonderful opportunity to show and demonstrate how, although Tom Bates says that he would be interested in changing things, he hasn't changed things. And the sit is a perfect example of um, what happened during that city council meeting. A lot of people showed up, a lot of people tried to express their, their concerns, and they were not heard. As a young man of color who lived in the city, I personally have been racially profiled by the Berkeley police. I actually was beat in front of KPFA when I was protesting what was happening there. And I was a part of the local advisory board and we were trying to pr protect free speech. What happens to a city where the rights of the civilians are no longer respected? What happens when a city that has a history of free speech movements of Black Panther organizations, of Great Panther organizations, what happens when their rights are taken away? We know that homelessness is a very real issue and a problem. The other day there was a man walking around my neighborhood and he explained that he got arrested for walking through San Pablo Park and that if he was to go to try and find a shelter, there is problems with thievery, there's problems with abuse, and there's not really enough places in Berkeley to go. So if we're to talk about how to address the problems of our city and address the problems with homelessness and address the problems with mental illness, we need to come up with solutions. We cannot give power to the police to continue to abuse their rights and to take away citizen rights. Yeah. to a lot of homeless advocates. We do not have the leadership in this community to, to link the dots of all the social services that are out there that are trying their damnedest to address our homeless needs. We need true leadership to gather all of those service providers together to understand where we have gaps, where we have overlaps, to work diligently to fill those gaps, work diligently to find people places to sleep so there's not even a question of can we put your tents on the park? I mean, 